This is an RNZ podcast. And I arranged with the prison guards to take her back to Mount Eden and release her from there because, of course, she was free to walk out. But the, the media were literally running around the, the high court, had all the entrances covered. There was no way we were going to sneak her out. Kia ora, I'm Jesse Mulligan. I'm host of the Daily Afternoons program on RNZ. And this is Crimes NZ, where I talk to people who are connected in one way or another with serious crimes that have happened here in New Zealand. And in this episode, I'm speaking with Stuart Grieve. He was the lawyer for dominatrix Renee Chignall. She was charged with the killing of Peter Plumley Walker, whose body was discarded at the Hooker Falls. She was arrested and charged with murder. Um, Plumley Walker had visited her uh, address in Rotomahana Terrace for a bondage and discipline session. And uh, on her instructions, he had died there um, while he was suspended, strung up by his neck, which is what he wanted to happen. Um, while he was left hanging there, um, the, she went off out of the room and had a cup of tea with Neville Walker. When they went back into the room about roughly, I think it was 20 minutes later, they found that he was dead. Um, and so things went from there. They panicked, um, took him in the in a car, his car, in fact, down, all the way down from Auckland down to to the Hooker Falls, just at Wairaki. Was that mm, almost four hours drive, three hours oh, drive? Three, probably. At that time of night, probably three, yeah. three at least, but not no, not four. Why Hooker Falls? Well... I don't know why they decided on Hooker Falls. I can only speculate, and it's pretty obvious. I mean, they must have thought that that was a pretty safe place to dispose of a body. Okay. And what happened next? Well... uh, What did they do at the falls? Well, um, I don't know the detail of how... They moved him from the car to tip him over the bridge. Um, I perhaps should explain that I made a decision very early on in the in my involvement with Renee. Um, she was in prison initially at the time before he got bail. Um, because of her age, her naivety, um, just her general manner... I felt that it was going to be highly unlikely that we would ever call her to give evidence. How old was she, by the way? She was 18, I think. That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't need to get a whole lot of detail from her in the same way that one would have to if one was Mm. contemplating calling evidence. You would spend hours with the with the client getting detailed instructions and you would prepare a detailed brief of evidence which would be of course confidential between you and your client um, but that wasn't necessary in this case we didn't need to get those detailed instructions from her so a lot of the detail for example your researcher showed me the the articles that there was one written not long after the first trial and another written twenty on the 20-year anniversary. A lot of those, th- those articles contain a lot of information that I simply didn't know about. Mm. And as a lawyer, wasn't particularly interested in. Precisely, mm. yeah, yeah. Nonetheless, some of the facts are accepted or would have been accepted in the, in the trial. So um, in whatever way, they threw the body uh, into the falls. yes. And then what happened next? Was it that the body was discovered? Well, it was weighted and discovered three or four days later. It came to the surface and was recovered by, I think, one of those jet boat operations down there. And then then it was taken 
the body was taken to the Rotorua pathologist, a forensic pathologist, who carried out a post-mortem. And um, that's where all the interest in the case, as far as we were concerned, started, because there were issues around the adequacy of that post-mortem and the conclusions that were reached. Um, and the forensic pathology became the focus, really, as far as the defence was concerned, uh, in all the trials. Three trials? Three trials. Well, the, the first jury convicted. Um, that, was, that conviction was overturned on appeal and a new trial was ordered because the Crown ran the case um, on the basis of murder either at Auckland or Taupo and the judge, the trial judge in his summing up got the summing up um, wrong in terms of how he put it to the jury so it wasn't possible to tell from the jury verdict the basis upon which they were saying he was guilty of murder. Mm -hmm. Was it Auckland? Was it Taupo? Okay. So there had to be a second trial. At the second trial, um, one, I think one, as far as we understand, one juror uh, disagreed with the, the, the majority who, who wanted to convict. Um, so there was well, a hung jury. So that led to the third trial. And what happened at the third trial? At the third trial, the, the third trial was different from the other two in that one of the important Crown witnesses giving evidence against Renee Chignall was Witness A, who had been arrested and charged with heroin uh, importation, serious charges. She was facing really serious charges. She alleged that, that Renee had made admissions to her and we were unable to... We could... At the earlier trials, we could em embark on some challenge to her, but we were unable to challenge, make a real challenge to her credibility until after her heroin charges had been dealt with. She was ultimately convicted. And once she'd, she'd been convicted, she could no longer claim privilege, uh, which could have been claimed had she been cross-examined about the circumstances of her offending. And so we were able to mount a serious cross-examination uh, um, of her um, based on the serious nature of her offending mm. and um, what she had said to the police during her police interviews and matters of that sort. Oh, along the lines of why should a jury believe a convicted heroin importer? Yes, mm. yes. Who had been given um, some favours in return for her, for her cooperation? She got a fairly light sentence and she was, at the time of the third trial, um, getting daily leave to go to Victoria University to do some studying. So, I mean, plainly, the, the jury, having acquitted on that third trial, didn't believe her evidence. What was the basis of your defence? How did you decide to defend the case as the man representing Renee Chignall? Well, we we ran it on the basis that if that it was an accidental death at Auckland at Rotomahana Terrace, um, the, although technically assaults had been committed on him in the form of the strangulation, but he consented to that, so that the that it was not manslaughter and therefore could not be murder at Auckland. Um, as far as the the Taupo allegation, because later the Crown uh, alleged murder at Taupo as well, and we said, well, we, we disputed that and said it certainly couldn't be proved 
that he had drowned. Um, I mean, the drowning was important because if he had drowned, it meant that he was alive when he went over the, over the bridge at the Hooker Falls. And our challenge to that was um, on the basis of pathology evidence, which we called to show that because of the, um, the um, degradation of the body having been in the falls for three or four days, it was not possible to um, determine at all with any confidence that he had drowned. Mm. And the defence uh, that it had happened um, during some sort of um, sexual act which he had consented to, was that a good defence? I mean, if, if you if the jury accepted that, would they have had to accept that Renee was not guilty of murder? Correct. I'm, I'm thinking of the Grace Mullane case, of course, where, yes. where the, yes. the judge famously said to the jury, you can't consent to your own death. Well, that's a bit different because, the, the, as I understand it, the Grace Mullane verdict was based on evidence that it would take about 10 minutes to strangle someone. And although it, it appeared, and I've only read the press reports, it appeared that the strangulation initially was with consent but was pursued beyond that. And so it became an unlawful act, mm -hmm. became manslaughter, and then there's the issue of was, was murderous intent proved. Uh, or And, of course, there's the construction, constructive definition of uh, constructive intent, which is um, doing an act known to be likely to cause death and being reckless as to the result. And that, as I understand, is the basis upon which uh, he was convicted of murder in that case. So it was a bit different. Okay. Um, at some point in proceedings, you actually turned up at a judge's house. Can you tell us that story? <laughs> yeah. Well, she was released on bail initially on the initial murder charge. And then having got the evidence, the police having got the evidence from witness A, they would have had statement. Well, they had statements from her. They then sought to and did. They rearrested Chignall on an another an alternative charge or a second charge of murder, murder at Taupo, and she was placed in custody. And um, we made a, an application for a, an ancient writ of habeas corpus. Um, which requires the the institution holding someone in custody to justify the legal basis for that. And our argument there was that there was no legal basis because she was already on bail on a very similar charge. The, the detail was minor. So that was heard urgently by um, Justice Barker uh, at his home um, in Auckland um, because someone's liberty was at stake and so it was dealt with uh, as the law does. It, it, at times it moves rapidly, not all the time, but uh, he, saw, he saw counsel at um, his home it, and there was only... Um, I appeared with my uh, assistant counsel, I think. We both appeared. And the order was made, and I, and I think Renee was then released from Mount Eden Prison, where she was being held in custody the following morning. How far back does that habeas corpus principle go? Hundreds of years. Have you made an application using it before? No. So that's a bit of a buzz, isn't it? It was certainly. Yeah, and it worked. It worked. <laughs> um, we should mention the victim. We should mention the victim. We should talk about the victim, Peter Plumley Walker, and, and what do we know about what was going on in his life around the time of the death? Well, at the time of the trials, as I didn't need to know anything much at all. Um, in those articles that I've referred to, there's quite a lot of detail that reporters have gleaned from interviews with his wife and I think a brother. It appeared, well, I think we knew that he, he was, on the day that he went to 
um, Rene Chignall's house. I think he had that day gone to the the district court for a um, for a divorce. I'm not sure whether that that was the day of the first decree, um, but so he was, um, you know, emotionally upset. He didn't want a, div- a divorce from his wife. She wanted the divorce from him for for reasons I don't know. So. Um, apart from that, we knew that he was a cricket umpire. Um, that was about all we knew at the time. Uh, and people are texting me jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and I only mention that, um, some quite clever jokes. I only mention that because I remember the jokes at the time. How big a deal was this case? Well, the media, I mean, it was a huge deal as far as the media were concerned. And um, um, I I found the media attention quite onerous to, I mean, I did my best to ignore it, but one couldn't. There were reporters every day. We walked to court, television cameras and so forth. So... um, when you were going to court or into court for the start of a day's proceedings, it was, I found that quite stressful. But once we got into court and got underway, we had more serious things to focus on. What did it mean for you as a lawyer to take on this case? Well, it was a high-profile case. It was, uh, as far as I was concerned... Um, as with all my cases, I, I wanted to do a good job. If I did a good job, um, well, that was really all I could hope for. One would hope, I hoped to be able to get her off, get an acquittal, but um, that was a long time coming. Um, but, um, yeah, um, and provided one could be seen to be doing a competent job, then it was good for one's reputation. Tell me about that third trial. Well, retrials are always hard for both prosecutors and defence counsel because, you know, it's, it's, it's regurgitating everything that had been done before. There, there aren't so many surprises. One struggles to um, come up with something... Um, a bit different to to um, a different angle, perhaps. Um, the thing that I recall about the third trial was the focus on the pathology evidence. The the at the pathologist we called Stephen Cordner <clears throat> has since become a, a close friend of mine. He comes from Melbourne, and um, when we go to Melbourne, we always catch up. Mm. Um, he's, he's an internationally renowned pathologist and he tutored me on, on, um, reading slides under a microscope, um, on the basis that I would cross-examine the crown pathologist on the crown pathologist view of the slides, which gave the basis for him saying that there was bruising around the neck. Uh, which meant that there had been bleeding at the time of the tipping of, well, the alive Peter Plumley Walker into the Hooker Falls. And Professor Cordner's evidence was that the the, um, putrefaction had been so bad that you simply couldn't tell anything from the slides. So that was my focus, the pathology. Tell me about the decision not to put her on the stand. Well, I've mentioned that to you already, and there's not much more I can say about that. Um, well, let me ask you this. What, what advice did you give her about the, uh, about the way she presented herself during the trial? Um, were you, you would have been conscious that the jury would have been looking at her, no doubt? Yeah, well, I would have given her, I don't remember it, but I would have given her the standard advice to, to look presentable, to um, 
not to engage in any way with the jury, but to keep focusing straight ahead, not to 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 make eye contact with them if you could possibly avoid it. Um, so that's standard advice that you give to any client. Um, you know, she was young and, um, you know, it was important that she dressed relatively conservatively, which, I, as I recall it, she did. But I couldn't for a moment describe what she was wearing now. Do you remember how she used to get to court? No, I don't, but I've read the articles that she was apparently driven in her father's sports car. Um, frankly, right now, I have no memory of that at all. Mm. Often, often, it wouldn't necessarily be the case that I would see her each day before court because she would be required to report early, around about 9.15, 9.30, would be taken down to the cells and brought up to court at 10 when the, once the judge was in court. So um, sometimes counsel can go down to the cells, but it just depends how busy you are getting ready for the day, whether I... And I, I wouldn't necessarily go down every day to see her. Was there a, a different lawyer representing Neville Walker? Yes, Christopher Harder. Famous name? Yes. <laughs> uh, and did you two work together at all, or are you in a way opposed to each other? No, um, we worked together, um, although he he would perhaps say not as closely as he would have liked. Um, Christopher was a very diligent fellow who undertook a lot of personal investigation into the case and um, by and large he shared that. Um, I mean, certainly it wasn't a case where my client was going to be in any way blaming his client for what occurred. So There must have been appealing as a defence, right? There's this older guy, you know, who's taken control and, you know, it kind of must be tempting as a defence to pin it on someone else who was there. Yes. But and the, is probably a, a more believable suspect for the jury. Yes, but the problem with that for us was that in order to run that defence, she would have had to give evidence. Uh -huh. um, we, we could not have... We could not have run that defence just by making a few loose comments in in in, in an address to the jury um, based on their observations of the different ages and so forth. We would have had to call evidence by her or from her to talk about her her relationship with Walker, and we, and we weren't we didn't we weren't ever going to do that. So tell me about um, the verdict then, the moment that you got the verdict and then I guess the reaction. Well, I was extremely relieved because, frankly, I had felt very strongly during the first two trials that we didn't get a fair crack of the whip. And... I felt at the end of the third trial, before the verdict, that we had had a fair trial. And I don't mind telling you, I knew the trial judge. He, he was at university at the same time as me. I, he wasn't a close personal friend, but I knew him well and respected him. And, and after the summing up to the jury while we were waiting for the jury verdict, I wrote him a letter to tell him that I appreciated the way he had conducted the trial, the fairness of it, and I, I arranged for that letter to be delivered to him before the verdict because I wanted it emphasised that what I was saying to him had nothing to do with the verdict. And so... Um, yeah, that my feeling was one of um, not vindication, but um, vindication in a way that the law that we we respected and the law that we thought would see us through came 
came through in the end and we'd had a fair trial and we were prepared, I was prepared and um, my associate lawyer was prepared to take whatever verdict um, we got, but we got an acquittal. Mm. And that's how it should have been because, in my view, the Crown couldn't prove murder beyond a reasonable doubt. And when that verdict is delivered, do your obligations to the client cease at that point? Is that the end of the relationship? Uh, Technically, it's the end of that relationship in terms of, yes, I'm no longer retained, of course, but um, the obligations of confidentiality and privilege still remain. Yeah. So I I went down to the cells afterwards and had a brief word to her. Um, I arranged f- with the prison guards. In those days, the prison guards were people who you got to know well and it's a bit different now and um, far more strict, you know, that they are controlled far more than they were in those days. And I arranged with the prison guards to take her back to Mount Eden and release her from there because, of course, she was free to walk out. But the the court, the media were literally running around the 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 high court. Had all the entrances covered. There was no way we were going to sneak her out without without having to face a barrage of questioning. So she was released from Mount Eden, and I've read the story. She, she had to she they had she had to go back and inside and get them to call her a taxi. <laughs> yeah. Did you form a friendship with her? Not at all, no. No. And how much have you talked to her since 1989? Um, I talked to her first um, a couple of years ago to get permission from her to appear on a documentary about the case that was made um, and, in fact, ran, I think, last year. Um, so I just wanted to get her permission to talk about the case uh, and I, I've, I've made it clear to her that I wouldn't be giving any any privileged information uh, out. So, that, so that's, all, that's all the contact I've had from her. Although um, I've had indirect contact because some time after the third trial... I got the odd retainer, which I understood had been um, referred, had been, had come to me after a reference from Renee. So, but I had no dealings with her over that at all until I, as I said, spoke to her about this documentary. We haven't talked much about her early life, um, but it sounded like she had it pretty tough. Well, you know. Be working at a brothel from the age of fifteen. Obviously, something has gone wrong. Um, do you know much about what what happened in her life after that case? No, only only what I've read in that twenty year after um, document uh, article in the uh, I think it was the Metro. Yeah, and well, it seems from I mean it's second hand. I don't know from her, but she's she's. She's had a child. Uh, her life is focused on looking after her son, who I think is now maybe 18 or something like that. He was 15 at the time, I think, of that Metro article. Um, no, no. I, look, I've got the numbers wrong, but she's got a son. She's a member of a community up north. Um, so that's really all I know about her. Does she stay with the guy, Neville Walker? No, no, no. They, she wanted to break up with him, so it seems. I didn't know this at the time, but she wanted to break up with him um, even before uh, the visit by Plumley Walker. Um, and so, no, she didn't stay with him. Um, she met someone up there, and again, this is in one of those articles, and um, who she had a child with, with him, but... 
I think not long after she became pregnant, he was killed in a car accident. So, yeah. The, the new partner? The new partner, yeah. Okay. We don't know where Neville Walker is now. Wouldn't have a clue. Was it the case of your life? Uh, well, at the time, it, it took over my life. Um, that's for sure. For about, I think it, the final case was, was it not late 1991. So 89, 90, 91, three years of my life, really. Um, but looking back now, um, look, it was a great case at the time, but no, I wouldn't call it the case of my life. Do you think about it much these days? No. Only when people like you call me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get stick about it? Must uh, occasionally come up, you know? Oh, sometimes. Bit of humour? Yes, now and again, but actually surprisingly rarely. Yeah, it doesn't come up much at all. Okay. And you made a friend out of it? I did. I did. A valuable friend. Yes. A really good friend. Yes. You've been listening to Crimes NZ, and I'm Jesse Mulligan. There are more episodes of this series on the RNZ podcast page or on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you catch your favourite podcasts. And if you like this one, try Black Sheep. That's another award-winning RNZ podcast series. Just head to the RNZ podcast page for this and other great podcasts.